you know, the next, the next speaker, uh, I have to say, I don't know anybody who brings more energy uh, to the campaigning for nuclear uh, uh, abolition uh, than Alan Ware. Uh, and with the uh, modesty that, that a number of other panelists have here, he used to introduce himself simply as a kindergarten teacher. Uh, Alan is a, a, peace act, a peace educator and activist from New Zealand. He was one of the leaders of the successful campaign in New Zealand to prohibit the, the presence of nuclear weapons, uh, and then globally to achieve uh, a ruling from the International Court of Justice on the illegality of nuclear weapons. Alan is the co-founder is a co-founder of Abolition 2000, as are several others in the audience here. Uh, he's the co-founder of uh, Unfold Zero. Uh, and Parliamentarians for Nuclear uh, Proliferation and Disarmament, for which he serves as the Global Coordinator. He has received a number of awards, including the UN International Year for Peace Award and the Right Livelihood Award, and has been nominated uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Alan, take it away. I'm particularly thankful to Friends and Quakers because uh, Friends and Quakers in New Zealand what support me to come over and to hang out over in the Northern Hemisphere uh, and to participate in peace actions. It's a little bit far to go home, so that's why I'm hanging out in the Northern Hemisphere. We have a few other Kiwis, who have, uh, New Zealanders, who have come over for the ban treaty negotiations, um, but they're not here today. They give their apologies. Uh, they're doing some preparation for the negotiations. Um, but it's great also that AFSC, the American Free and Service Committee, I think were the ones that along with Western States Legal Foundation came up with the notion of peace and planet, uh, of the idea that as the nuclear abolition campaign, we needed to make the connection with these other issues, the issues of war prevention, of social justice, of climate protection, sustainable development. These issues are so important to make the links. Uh, and the fact that all of you have come here today in this heat is a testament to <laughs> understanding that these connections are really important and that they can strengthen our movement. Uh, so thank you again for that. Um, I'm really pleased to come near the end because I think we're looking a bit now not just at what the ban treaty is but beyond the ban. You know, what next after it's adopted? And John's sort of given a little bit of a taste of this, what impact might this have on those that possess the nuclear weapons uh, and those that rely on the nuclear weapons. Because these are the ones we really have to change if we want to eliminate the weapons. It's really important what the non-nuclear states are doing. It's really important that they will strengthen uh, their commitment to a nuclear weapons free world and reaffirm the norm of prohibition of nuclear weapons. But we also then need to say, how is it, what do we do next? And that's where I think this gathering is so important. I want to just reflect a little bit on the experience from my country, New Zealand, because we are a country that was very pro-nuclear. Uh, very pro-nuclear. Uh, when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, New, New Zealanders were dancing in the streets. We believed that was the end of the war, that we were going to be next. Japan had already started the invasion of Australia, and we were next on the list. So we felt uh, that saved us. Uh, then when the Cold War progressed, we were right in behind the United States, France and the UK. We supported the nuclear tests, we welcomed their weapons into our harbours. Uh, we even had one of our Prime Ministers said the mistake that the United States made in Vietnam was their unwillingness to use the ultimate weapon. Yeah. This was our country. Uh, and it wasn't just on uh, pro-nuclear weapons, we were pretty pro-war. Our country got involved in just about every war we could, whether it was the Boer War, the Malaya War, the Korean War, the First World War, the Second World War. None of these were in New Zealand, they were all in other countries. Uh, did I get in war? The Vietnam War. We were like, you know like the real little dogs often have the biggest barks and the ones the most vicious? We were like country, you know, forgotten down the other end of the world. We wanted the big bark to show, hey, we're up there with you. We're up there with the, with the big powerful countries. It was part of the status, it's part of this, like belonging, it's part of thinking that you're going to have better political relations and trade relations if you go and fight wars with these people. So we we're pretty aggressive. So to turn that around was actually quite something. Uh, now it looks as though, oh, New Zealand is a peaceful country, you're always peaceful, but it's not true. We were actually, we were a pretty aggressive country and we're very pro-nuclear. 
the humanitarian impact of the nuclear test was one of the critical issues that helped turn that around. But it wasn't the only one. And in fact, it wasn't the main one that got us to be nuclear free. It was the one that raised people's attention, you know, the, I, knowing that these nuclear weapons are so horrific. Not just what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but what happened Marshall Islands and what was happening still in uh, French Polynesia with the tests. But that only convinced less than half the population of New Zealand. What really moved the country was the security arguments. The security arguments, I think, are so important to winning the debate with the Allies and the nuclear weapon states, where they say nuclear weapons protect us because the threat of us or our friend, the United States, using them on our behalf will deter this enemy, whether it's Japan or Indonesia or Soviet Union back then or Russia now, is actually illogical. In fact, if you have the nuclear weapons, you become a target. And when we started reversing the logic and talking about the real security issues, then we got all the people in the middle and even some of the conservatives go, oh, maybe those nuclear weapons aren't so good. So we used that argument. We also said, look at the conflicts that we are having. We had a conflict with a very aggressive country, Indonesia, that occupied a very small country. It was waging a horrific occupation there with, we don't know, maybe 20% of people killed in East Timor through that occupation. Nuclear weapons weren't doing anything to resolve that situation. Uh, the nuclear tests that France was doing in the Pacific was violating our sovereignty with the radiation. Having the United States, our ally, was doing nothing to stop the French nuclear tests. The US was cooperating with the French on those tests. We started using more the other mechanisms for these key security issues, the United Nations, the International Court of Justice. We took a case against France on nuclear testing, and it was that that pushed France to stop testing. It was the United Nations working cooperatively uh, that managed to end the Indonesian invasion in East Timor. It wasn't nuclear weapons. So if we now fast track forward to where we are now, the ban treaty is very good. The humanitarian argument is very good. But it hasn't, neither of those are going to convince the nuclear armed states or their allies to give up nuclear weapons. We do need to engage in the security arguments. And there's a fantastic resource for doing that. And Tim's at the back of the room here. You can get probably signed copies from him today, seeing he's here, disarming the nuclear argument. And he takes on the arguments that the Allies and the nuclear weapon states use for justifying the nuclear weapons, and he demolishes them. So I recommend that. But the arguments are not just enough. Oh, sorry, there's copies out in the, out in the back. Tim, Tim, stand up there. This is the one. Great book. Just come out. Hot off the press. But it's not just logic that's going to win the day, because there's a lot of politics involved. So that's where it's also, I'm going to say, three more aspects that I think are really important. A political pro politics, process, and money. Uh, politics. This is where engaging with legislators is so important, uh, particularly parliamentarians because they are the ones that are making decisions on these security issues in the parliament. They influence policy. One of the ways we managed to shift the policy in New Zealand was because we worked with parliamentarians from all political parties. We managed to get a small group in the Conservative Party to actually start agreeing with us. And it took them a while. It took them like six years, really, to change the policy of the Conservative Party, but they were able to do it. So now, our nuclear-free policy is cross-party. Every political party supports it. So it's really important to work with your parliamentarian, regardless of which political party. You might think, maybe it's a Republican, you've got no show. Well, I've actually met an incredible Republican who's like right-wing on so many things, but we've managed to get him to agree to a process for nuclear disarmament and supporting multilateral nuclear disarmament negotiations, a Republican. Uh, Senator Roger Wicker, how we managed to get to move him was because he's the chair of the Peace and Security Committee of the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. 
a body that's designed to look at cooperative security and law and resolving conflicts, not threatening others. So working with parliamentarians is very important. Uh, but that's not enough. There also needs to be a process to feed into. And we have one next year, a very important process. The United Nations will be holding a high-level conference on nuclear disarmament. This is not just a meeting. This is a high-level conference. High-level conferences are when governments expect that there's going to be something achieved. It's not just a talk shop. For example, we just had the UN high-level conference on oceans two weeks ago. The first high-level conference on oceans. It was incredibly successful. They drafted, adopted a 14-point action plan to protect the oceans. We had a high-level conference on sustainable development. It adopted the sustainable development goals. So next year is the high-level conference on disarmament. We can push now the allies and the nuclear weapon states to go along and push them to adopt measures. We can also highlight the ban treaty at the high-level conference. Lastly, money, and I've only got 50 seconds to talk about it, but it's the most important probably because money is what makes the world go round. When we adopted our nuclear-free policy, the United States tried to stop us by launching an economic boycott, but we thwarted that. Actually, it was the US woman who thwarted that by launching the Girlcott campaign. Girlcott is the opposite of boycott. So there were women all around the United States going out asking to buy New Zealand nuclear-free butter and New Zealand nuclear-free ice cream. Trade between New Zealand and the United States doubled over the next five years, thanks to the Girl Cock campaign and the publicity. I think we can do the same. We've got the, the weapons corporations are incredibly powerful at the moment. They're dominating the Congress here. Ed Markey's bill in the Senate to slash the funding for nuclear weapons can only get a handful of Democrats on board. But what we're launching is a worldwide nuclear divestment campaign. In our country, we've done it. We got our public funds to divest from nuclear weapons and their performance rating has gone up to like the top in the world. If we can use that argument on other public funds with all these countries that are signing on to the ban treaty, regardless of whether or not it specifically prohibits financing, we can use that ban treaty to encourage them to get their public funds to divest from nuclear weapons. We can give the experience that the performance of those funds will probably increase, and so that will give economic argument um, and that will then help to support President Nazarbayev's initiative, which is to cut military spending and put it into sustainable development goals. So I think we've got some really good things to move after the ban treaty that can have impact on the nuclear armed states and allies. We've had experience that it's worked in the past, and we look forward to working with you from down under New Zealand with everyone else in the world. Thank you very much. Yeah.